Hello and welcome to Lewis at Home. I'm Lewis Pugh, this is my home, and this is my attempt at launching a new video series about video games. And today we're talking about video game console launches. So console launches are great, they're exciting. It's something that really only happens in the gaming world where every five to 10 years, the big players, Sony, Nintendo, Microsoft, they all compete to make their best vision of what a gaming console should be. And then they support this with games for the next five to 10 years. And we start this cycle all over again with a new generation. And these generations are most of the time clearly defined. You know what you're getting yourself into and things are changing. So last year, three years after the PS4 launch, Sony announced the PS4 Pro and released it. And if you buy the PS4 Pro, your games will look better. And Microsoft's doing the same. Last year they announced Project Scorpio and it's coming out this year if rumors to be true. And if you buy the Scorpio, your Xbox games will look better. And so again, things are changing. Originally, you would buy a system and it didn't matter. If you bought it launch day, halfway through, near the end, you were kind of locked in, you were getting the same games, running on the same graphics, you were getting the same experience as everyone else. So today I'm gonna to talk about my top five reasons why these mid-generation console upgrades are good. So number one, better graphics. Now this is a simple one. You're playing the same games, but they're running better. They look nicer, they've got higher resolution, maybe faster frame rates. What's not to like? Number two, faster load times. Another simple one, the same games, but you're waiting less to get straight into the action. Surely nothing but a good thing. Number three, new features. So beyond the graphics, beyond the load times, sometimes we get new features, completely new things. Uh, whether it's like an ultra Blu-ray player or a HDR mode for your TV, uh, or a, a better 3D mode on the new 3DS, uh, we get these new features added to the system. And so we're getting better systems to play the same games. Surely that's a win-win. Number four. Exclusive games. Now, what could be better? So if we back up slightly, you kind of need to justify this one a bit more. Uh, you need to show that only with the new power here, you can provide an exclusive game. Uh, and there's not a huge amount of examples of this in recent years, but we can look towards a new 3DS. And its best example is with Xenoblade Chronicles 3D. And this was a port of probably the biggest game for the Wii. Um, and it was absolutely massive, giant in scale, very, very impressive game on the console. And just a few years later, it's got a portable version. Um, and just as a kind of a casual player, at least I look at it and go, there's no way that could have ran on the 3DS. Um, they, they really needed that new 3DS to run it. Kind of fair play. So... Exclusive games can be good. Number five, options. So finally you got your options. Uh, you don't actually, you don't have to buy a PS4 Pro. You don't have to buy Project Scorpio when it comes out. And you don't even need to buy a new 3DS. But you do have your options. And whether you bought the system the first time around and you want to upgrade or you didn't and you then have a choice whether to go for a cheaper model with less features or a more expensive model with new shiny parts. That choice is yours and surely choice is only a good thing. So we've gone over the good things or I've gone the five best things about mid-generation launches so it's only fair at this point. I now present to you my five worst reasons why we should never have mid-generation console launches. Number one, worst graphics. Okay, so say I've got a PS4 and the PS4 Pro comes around. My, my games don't change, the graphics do not change for me. Um, 
no one goes into my home overnight and kind of downgrades my PS4. But that Pro didn't exist before, and now it does. So I know my, those games could run better if I had that new system. And kind of in a weird comparison, if you're looking at footage before you buy a game, you are now getting a, a less graphically impressive version. So your graphics are getting worse in a, in a bizarre way. Um, hmm. Number two, slower loading times. Okay, a, a bit like the, the graphics argument here. Um, if you're seeing these improvements coming down the line for this newer, shinier machine, it, it, if, if it hasn't actually directly affected yours, it still, by comparison, makes your machine look older and slower. Um, just because you've got facts out there that, oh, this game runs faster on this new machine. Uh, it makes yours feel a little bit less special. Number three, locked out features. Now, this is where things get a little bit foggy because a lot of the new features introduced with this sort of mid-generation console upgrade is hardware based. So we talked about, say, the Ultra Blu-ray drive uh, or, or the, even that new improved 3D effect on the new 3DS. These are features which could only be introduced because of hardware. You can't do it by software. Um, so there is that, but like the arguments above, it does make you think, even if it's not deliberately so, that knowing that there's these more impressive machines out there, more powerful, whatever reason, they can do more tricks now, it makes your system less impressive. It does make it feel less special. And that's not great feeling, is it? So number four, you can't play this game. Yeah, so this hasn't happened much yet. I did give a pretty good example. Um, Xenoblade Chronicles 3D, you cannot play on the 3DS. You would have had to go out and bought that new model if you wanted to play that game. I suppose Sony and Microsoft have come out saying that they're not going to lock down. They're not going to have exclusive games on the Pro of the Scorpio. They're all a big happy fan. They're all going to play the same games. Companies do change their mind on occasion. Uh, but if this does happen, people will not be happy. Number five, options. Finally, options. Uh, options are stressful. We are giving lots of new choices now. On the face of it, it doesn't seem like much. Most of these consoles, they just have the two versions. They have the original version, the one which comes in about halfway through. Doesn't seem too bad, does it? Well, how about next time rounds when the next console launches, you're thinking to yourself, well, if I wait a bit, a newer version of this system probably come out. And by that time, it's probably be sooner rather than later as well. And what if you have multiple cons consoles? If you've got a PlayStation or an Xbox or a Nintendo, that's a lot of upgrades to keep on top of if you want to go down that route. Or do you buy certain ones at launch and you get the upgraded versions of others when they come out? It's a, it's more to manage. It's consoles used to be about the simplicity of gaming. You would, you know, you just buy the box. You would plug it up. You would play the games. And now we're creeping ever so slightly into the uh, the more complex PC territory, which uh, admittedly we're we're still far away from it, but. If trends continue, you never know, we may end up there. So, we have explored some of the pros and some of the, the cons of these mid-generation console upgrades. And I also wanted to share my favourite, worst and best console upgrades of past. And so these are quite old examples. And let's start with the positive. And then we can end on the negative. That'd be a nice note, won't it? Uh, so I think the best example of a, a system having a nice upgrade uh, and, and having the balance here of having the, the people who bought the original system still feel good and then people kind of t being able to take advantage of what's new also feel good is the N64. And I know you may be thinking to yourself, 
Surely, Lewis, why would you choose the N64? The 64DD was a failure. It was a commercial failure. Uh, it only released in Japan. It had about a handful of games. It was a commercial flop. Why would you possibly choose? But I'm not choosing it. I'm choosing the N64 expansion pack. Uh, the little black kind of cartridge thing with a little red top on it. Uh, it, it was ultimately 4 megs of RAM, which you just slotted in. Dub doubled the RAM of the N64. Had 8 then. Brilliant. 8, 8, 8 meg megs of RAM. What a world we lived in. Uh, but what was so great about the N64 expansion pack is that it had a lot of these benefits of what we've been talking about with like, oh, the fancy PS4 Pro and the Scorpio and so on. Um, it on compatible games, you got better graphics, increased frame rates, high resolution games, and there were even games which took advantage at such a level that it had its exclusive games. Both Donkey Kong 64, Majora's Mask, both needed that expansion pack for it to work. So again, you go, okay, yeah, it's got some of the same benefits, but it's got the same cons. Why is this a good example? And the reason why is, the expansion pack was cheap. It was very cheap. Uh, so cheap, in fact, that sometimes Nintendo bundled it with games. Uh, games which required it, mostly. Um, but there were several games it came bundled with. Uh, they used to bundled versions. And maybe they cost a little bit more. But we're talking like an extra £10, $10 or something. And so I think sometimes it was just literally just included for the same flat-out price you would expect. And so that really does eliminate most of my concerns um, because if a game requires the thing you need but you get the thing with the game what's the problem uh, but yeah it had a load of great advantages so expansion pack really did it right in a bizarre in a bizarre way I hope if it was possible to do that in the modern era I would love this the equivalent this little chip which could come include with the price of certain games and you plug it into your system, and then you can take advantage of better graphics. It's, it seems bizarre. But my most favourite worst system upgrade is the N-Gage QD. And that's, that's, that's this thing here. Uh, it's a phone by Nokia or a game deck, as they called them back in the day. And this obviously was the the upgrade, the, the mid-generation upgrade to the original Engage. And the original Engage had three main flaws. The, you, to swap games, you had to, on the original, take off the back, take out the battery, which would turn it off, take the game out, put the new game back in, put the battery back in, put the back back on, Turn it back on, and it would remind you it was an early smartphone by taking at least a minute to turn back on. And only then could you play that game. Of course, it being a portable, you would like to swap games fairly often, because this was before the age of the digital download. The QD fixed that issue. Problem number two with the original Engage. It had this thing called side talking. This handy little feature, which meant you hold your phone like this, Again, not this one, but the original. Um, it was one of the most favourite things of the internets to hate about the original Engage. Um, and the QD fixed that too. Both the microphone and the speaker are on the, the front, on the face of the phone. And so you would hold it like this to talk. And although this might look slightly humorous nowadays, I don't think it even looks that odd. Um, at the time, that was fine. Phones are still big and bulky that fits in fairly well. So it fixed that, the QD. Two out of two so far. And so number three uh, of the biggest concerns of the original Engage, according to Lewis Pugh, is the buttons. And the buttons were just flat, uh, like a lot of phones were. Um, but the Engage was, as Nokia tries to remind us, uh, a game deck. Its purpose was to play games. And so you just have these flat buttons to run your thumbs over. Not great, but the QD fixed this too. It has these nice round buttons and your main gaming buttons, because there are a lot of buttons on it. So the five and the seven were your main ones. They were kind of your A and your B, or your Game Boy. They're bigger than the rest. 
it's actually fairly comfy to rest your thumbs on and play some games. And so the QD fixed that too. So three out of three, not too bad for the worst console upgrade ever. And so why is it the worst? Uh, and the worst, re and the reason it's the worst is because it only fixes problems. And it just highlights that there were problems with the original one. So what was the upgrade mechanism? If you had the original, you saw the QD come down and goes, ah, they fixed the problems. You just buy an expensive system again, probably more expensive than the one you've already got. And I mean, this was an early smartphone and a gaming console hybrid thing. It was expensive. It cost many times the cost of what the Game Boy Advance did, its nearest competitor of the time. And so there was no easy way to upgrade. Uh, that and the fact it just fixed things. It more so just highlighted the issues with the engaged and actually provided benefits, in my opinion. Which seems odd, because I think if they re released this version originally, it probably would have done quite a lot better. But that's my reasons why the, the QD was the worst upgrade ever. Um, and so what have we learned? So hopefully we've learned something today. And so I think that if you're a platform holder and you want to release hardware, if you want to upgrade your system and you've coming to me to help, don't burn your early adopters. Don't make players feel left out, locked out, or unappreciated. Do feel free to offer improvements, but if you're going to fix issues, which you somehow can't fix on the original versions, you're only going to highlight that you had problems, that you had these things which were broken. And so it's a bit of a, uh, a backward situation, but don't have a broken system to begin with. Don't fix things which are fundamentally broken. I mean, if you do, I mean, you have to, but you've dug your own grave at that point. Offer improvements at an affordable price. Make both early adopters and the people buying your new system, your new upgraded system for the first time, both feel happy about being in your environment, in your ecosystem to play your games, and they will come back. And that's the show for today. And so this is this is new. This is the first show. And so let me know how it's been. I've got no idea at this point. Of course, you can let me know in the comments um, if you did like it, oddly, uh, and you'd like to see more. Of course, standard YouTube rules apply. You hit subscribe and you'll be told when there's another one. It's, it's a very simple exchange here. And so thanks for watching and hopefully I'll see you next time. Goodbye. Why does nobody understand me? I run games at a PlayStation level and I'm I'm competing against the Game Boy Advance. I've got critically acclaimed games like Pathway to Glory. I've got online play, local Bluetooth play. I've got internet browsing capabilities. I'm a phone as well. I can do all this stuff. Everybody hates me. It's all my older brother's fault.